Hi, Olivia here. Welcome to Quanta Business Insights. Each week we explore new perspectives on the changing nature of business with thought leaders from around the world. And I like to put a special emphasis on what I feel is our most valuable asset, our human capital. So today I'm excited to have as my guest Stuart Levine, and we'll be discussing Collaboration 2.0. Building Emotional Intelligence and Resolutionary Thinking in the Digital World. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Stuart. He spent years as a practicing attorney and then realized that fighting was a very ineffective way of resolving problems. Then he became a marketing executive, and while working for AT&T, he discovered why most collaborative initiatives fail. So he started to figure out how to build the relationship and culture that are essential for individual as well as organizational effectiveness. And he now works with organizations where he empowers team members to fully express themselves and help them develop the skills necessary to effectively engage with others. Stuart, welcome to Quantum Business Insights. Thank you, Lavinia. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks. So, with the advances in technology and globalization over the last few decades, we've seen business roles become much more complex and specialized. So, it's harder for anybody to do it all. I I would like to do everything myself, but I'm looking at things now where I really have to partner and outsource and be able to work with other people to really create something bigger. And so I really think to do anything large, we need to collaborate. And I think my listeners <clears throat> have a good understanding of the basics of collaboration. How do you define collaboration 2.0 and what is resolutionary thinking? Great. So two uh, critical questions. Um, I actually, one of the books I've written is a book called Collaboration 2.0. And Essentially, what Collaboration 2.0 is about is that in the workplace today, we're working very, very differently than we worked even 10 or 15 years ago or even five years ago. This whole notion of of virtual work and a virtual workforce and um, uh, people working in distributed teams with people all around the, the, the country. So all of the ordinary principles of effective collaboration apply. Plus, uh, we need some additional thinking that has us uh, connect more effectively with people that we don't see face-to-face on a daily basis. So that's that kind of one piece, uh, one response to one of your questions. And the other question, what resolutionary thinking is, it's a mindset. And the word resolutionary, I'm really proud to say I was working with a client about 25 years ago. And at the end of me coaching him through a very, very difficult uh, situation of conflict, he pointed at me and he said, Stuart, you are a resolutionary. And so (laughs) (laughs) as opposed to, you know, spending a lot of money on a branding expert, um, I've had that on my business card ever since. Oh, Um, that's great. Yeah, as a matter of fact, funny story, when the iPad 2 came out, if you open the Apple website, the, the big headline on the website was solutionary, uh, you know, oh, wow. which a number, of, a number of friends pointed out and said to me, they were talking about the quality of the resolution, um, and, and there are some parallels in that thing. Building blocks for creating a culture of collaboration. What are those building blocks and what? And how does that work to create that culture? Sure. So here, here are kind of the, 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 the critical elements. And, and, and let me actually um, back up a second in the sense of, you know, talking about culture. Culture is a word that's often used in organizations. You know, people will often say, we want to improve our culture. We want to do a culture change initiative. And... Um, the question came up for me when I was first thinking about this and first heard this conversation in the workplace. So what is culture? What's the culture of an organization? And, and I started to do a little bit of thinking about it and a little bit of noodling and a little research and a little conversation. And what I came to is that the culture of an organization is really embodied and held in those relationships mm. that make up the way people treat and act um, with each other. And 
I then took it a step further and I said, okay, so what are the relationships based upon? And, and, and I, I said, well, relationships are based upon spoken and unspoken agreements. Mm. And I said, okay, um, that's cool. And where I went, the next step was that agreements are either implicit or explicit. And we often get into a lot of trouble and into conflict when we have implicit agreements with the people that we were working with. You know, like you kind of mentioned earlier in, in the introduction that um, I, I noticed what was missing when I was working at AT&T. Mm-hmm. And what was missing was that people weren't making explicit promises when they were trying to work together. So I've developed this whole buy-in of work around having conscious, intentional agreements. And, and that's the way you really can impact a culture. Well, so let me just kind of put that into something that I could also understand. And it sounds like people, so think of just about a couple and how we think the other person knows what we're thinking, right? And then we get accused of, well, I can't read your mind. So it's really the same thing, kind of translated into business, right? Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, and I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, the, the piece you left out of my, my introduction was that while I was at AT and T, I started to study divorce mediation, and I started to do that work. And in working with couples that were divorcing, which is when people are in their worst state, I developed some models around communication, collaboration, conflict resolution, mm-hmm. and I was having a lot of really good success with couples when they were in the the worst state in the world. And I said, "Wow, if it's, if these models are working here." Um, I imagine it would be a little bit easier if I started to use them in larger organizations. And that's what I've been doing for the last, you know, 25 to 30 years. Interesting. So really there's no difference between, of course, the level of connections more intense in a couple. But the skills and the self-awareness and um, the ability to implicitly or explicitly express ourselves uh, it's really the same formulas, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 people working with each other, and in today's uh, world of work, uh, things can get pretty intense between people um, mm-hmm. because folks are working, you know, long hours, um, and and there's a lot of connectivity that is uh, essential, and. Some of the some of the outlets that relieve some of the tension in personal relationships are not present in business relationships. So, <laughs> so yes, uh, we won't so, go into those details, but I get what you mean. Exactly. And so, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, people, um, and I kind of reflected this earlier, but people actually need other people more to get their jobs done than they used to, right? Because you know, most of, I mean, I work with data and uh, I can't create it myself. So I'm having to have a good relationship with people in IT, which sometimes can be challenging because they're not, not necessarily used to working with people. They're more comfortable maybe sitting in a cubicle all day programming. And yet uh, they need, in, a, in most businesses, they need to be providing a service or at least making what they're creating available and understandable. And so, uh, so I'm finding that communication is so much more important and, and being explicit about what I want instead of assuming that they know it. <laughs> so. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, the folks that you mentioned are, are sometimes not the most um, user-friendly people. <laughs> and, and in terms of you know, collaboration, um, you know, it used to be, if you think back to the industrial world, um, things got produced on a conveyor belt. Each person did their discrete task one step at a time, and in some ways, nobody had to talk to each other. Now, productivity happens as a result of everybody coordinating and collaborating with each other. Um, you know, marketing is involved, sales is involved, operations uh, are involved, um, finance is involved. Um, research and development is involved, and and all of these people have to work together 
um, in order to produce uh, a, a, a valuable, quote, knowledge worker uh, product. And so, I would... Well, I would add to that that they also have a higher skill set. So back when the assembly line was happening, if somebody didn't work out or they were sick, it was a lot easier to just plug somebody in. They didn't need to have a lot of technical knowledge to run that. You know, they were part of the conveyor belt or the process. But today, uh, people are just, they just basically have to have computers, some basic computer skills and often much more knowledge than in the past. Would you agree? Ab- ab- absolutely. Um, so, to pick up on the um, on the emotional intelligence piece and the and the buckets essential for effective collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from the the technical knowledge and subject matter expertise, um, there is um, uh, and, and more and more organizations are actually going to this place, um, hiring not so much technical skills. Because the organizations figure we can teach people those, but actually hiring for emotional intelligence, hiring for EI, uh, to get people who can play well on the sandbox. Now, wow. um, yeah. Now, in, a, in addition, okay, what's also critical um, is what I call um, resolutionary thinking, uh, <laughs> bringing a certain mindset to the table. Mm-hmm. Number two the capacity to um, communicate effectively with others, a good set of communication skills, mm-hmm. which is, is, is part of emotional intelligence. Um, and, and those are kind of the, the critical pieces in addition to um, capacity to um, move through differences in conflict well, because that's the way we get um, more effective um, uh, products and services and higher levels of innovation. Yeah. So those are some of the some of the critical um, critical buckets. Okay. Well, so can you tell me a little bit about the cycle of resolution and how we can recognize that? Sure. the 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 cycle of resolution is is kind of um, it's it's a model for moving through differences and conflict. And, you know, in my work over the last 30 years, what I've found is that about 65 to 70 percent people are essentially conflict averse, mm. meaning um, it's not something they want to deal with um, because it's kind of messy. <laughs> that, that, yeah, and that, that is actually even um, – the volume is turned up on that. It's even more important for young workers in the workplace, for the millennial generation. And why? Because um, millennial folks were brought up um, connected by technology, and it's real easy just to disconnect from someone you don't like, um, as opposed to having to move through situations of conflict. Okay, like, like they would could just unfriend them, basically. Or whatever. One of the reasons that people are conflict averse is they don't have a mind map of the process, um, and they have made a choice that conflict is a, um, a, a part of. Um, life uh, and 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 dealing with differences are just essential in in today's universe and um differences show up and we have uh, conflict very often not because someone's trying to be bad to us not because they're trying to hurt us but uh even though we look alike even though we're we're taught we're in western dress even though we're speaking the english language um, people are wired differently, different operating systems. Um, and so, you know, a key is, is not to get plugged in when you feel a situation of conflict with others or, or, or to kind of move through that plug-in um, uh, as quickly as you can, which is part of um, emotional intelligence. Or yeah. would another way of being, saying that be don't take it personally? Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. Now, the 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 fact that you know conflicts show up and happen um, was brought home to me in very very clear relief about you know, and I and I still tell the story because it's still so true. About 15 years ago, I was doing a lot of one day seminars. As a matter of fact, I did. Um, 600 one day seminars in five year period. Wow. All right. Wow, I, I, I started 
But uh, I started to have this uh, bad dream that I died alone in a Holiday Inn someplace. <laughs> right? and, and that's when I knew it was time to start doing something else. So, right. um, yeah. So, what I was, I was usually I would fly into a city, pick up a rental car, and drive 30, 40 minutes between locations. This week, I was working small cities like Billings, Montana, and Cheyenne, Wyoming, and every night I had to take a plane back to Salt Lake City and pick up a second plane. Mm. And by... Um, right, by Thursday, I was just exhausted. And as, I, as I'm waiting for a late plane, very bleary-eyed, I, I notice a woman out of the corner of my eye start to see her infant child, and she puts a bib on the child's neck, and I can't open my eyes. And finally, I'm able to fix in on this bib, and what does the bib say? The bib says, spit happens. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, aha, there's a message from central casting. It's not a question of whether or not spit happens. Spit happens. Hmm. And so conflict shows up. No matter how good your agreements and understandings are with other people, conflict shows up, and it's magnified uh, when we're working uh, with groups and teams. Now, mm. having said that, the schematic of the cycle of resolution, if people could imagine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move around the clock now clockwise, okay? okay. Up, at, up at, um, uh, at midnight or noon at 12 is a place called resolution. And that's when everybody's together. You're on the same page. You're on the same track. You're heading in the same direction. There's a sense of alignment. And that's what you want for effective collaboration. You want an alignment of you and energy. All right? Mm -hmm. um, so lo and behold, move over to about 1.30 on the clock. And, you know, there's conflict. There's spit happening. It just, it just shows up, right? Uh -huh. um, at about 3 o'clock is what I call resolutionary thinking or the attitude of resolution, the mindset that we bring to situations okay. of conflict. And kind so of like here, the willingness to work on it in some ways, too. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, knowing that I, I've got to get through this, I've got to work with this person over the long term, so it's the, it's the mindset that you bring to it. And some of the key elements, number one, um, abundance. Um, not thinking win, lose, not thinking um, um, I've got to get this one, this is my turn, uh, not thinking I'd be right. But thinking abundance, that if we get creative, which another, is another one of the elements, they can get theirs and I can get mine, if we can figure this out. Um, being open and disclosing. Right. Seeing this process as a process of learning, teaching and learning, and teaching and learning, sharing each other's perspectives to understand um, so that you might be educated to something that you hadn't thought of before. Um, taking responsibility for moving through it. Um, Conflict is an emotional presence, so you can't give what is an emotional presence inside you to a manager, to a coach, to a therapist, to a lawyer. You're the one that needs to take care of it. So those are some of the key pieces of re resolutionary thinking. So let me ask you something because I was right with you, and then when you said conflict, you can't give it to somebody because it's an emotional presence within you. So... Um, what if one, let's just take two people. If one person has a conflict and the other one doesn't, do they both have a conflict or is, it, is, is there an out, like, is there an energy out, uh, be, uh, I guess you almost have to have a, because you have to have it with someone. I guess, no, I should take that back. You could have a conflict within yourself, but that's probably not what we're talking about here. But if you have a conflict in a team, then it's, it's either in reaction to or reflective of something outside of you, it, but it, I guess it's possible nobody else experiences it until you express it. Is that true? Yeah, exactly. And if you really want total alignment of energy, which is what I say is essential for high-performance teams, if one person is having a, a, a problem or challenge and nobody else is aware of it, that person needs to educate others and make them aware of it. Okay. okay. Okay, that makes sense. 
That makes sense. So that we can, you know, now move through it so that, uh, I'll use a technical term, so there is no chatter that gets in the way of an effective collaboration and productivity. Wow. Okay? All right. So, so everybody stays in alignment. That's, that's my aspiration in working with people. So moving a little further around the clock. So three o'clock is this mindset, um, this attitude of resolution, this resolutionary thinking. 4.30 is kind of the first real interactive step of the process of resolving or moving through conflict, and that is telling stories. Everybody gets to tell their story. You know, what's going on for them, okay? Um, and people will have some different stories, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so telling the story, getting it out on the table, getting the facts out, all right? Mm-hmm. Six o'clock is kind of another mindset piece. It's the way we listen to others, And it's critical that we try to listen from a sense of hearing all concerns and starting to think and analyze, hmm, what might be fair? Hmm. Uh, What would take care of everybody's concerns in this situation? All right? Mm -hmm. So moving along a little further, and the big mistake, by the way, that people make with moving through conflict is that they don't deal with the emotional aspects and there's an emotional residue involved and people get passive aggressive and it's not really resolved. So long about 7.30, I have a little piece called Getting Current Complete, which is a way of dealing with emotion and moving through it in a way that's not too touchy-feely, not too much psychologizing, um, which you don't really want in the workplace. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, all right. So long about uh, 9 o'clock, we have what's called an agreement in principle. And that is painting with broad brush. How are we going to resolve this? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I still be on the team? Can I still keep my job? Um, And and it's real important to paint with a broad brush because people breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. Aha. I, I have an idea of what the future is going to be like. And so, then, can I ask yeah. you, uh, do, sure. is this agreement something that's developed by the group, or is it something you kind of tell them, or do you pull from what they're saying? How does the agreement take shape? Great, okay. So I just said paint with a broad brush, okay? The next step at around um, 1030, that's a full agreement. And... Um, no, it's it well. No, let's put it this way. I just worked with a group yesterday, mm-hmm. and they were learning how to use agreement. All right, mm-hmm. and I actually I acted as the facilitator, but there's an agreement model that I have. Ten things that you need to do, um, and and for folks, is a new agreement about the future. Okay, mm-hmm. the best way to prevent conflict. And the best way to build an effective culture is to have explicit agreements. And I I developed this 10-element model um, that people can use to make sure that they are on the same page. And and when people first start to use this 10-element agreement, they think they've discovered sliced bread. (laughs) Because, Because in so many aspects of life, we don't have clear, effective agreements, hmm. uh, both personal and professional. And that's the thing I noticed when I was at AT&T, that everybody was moving into action. Everybody was ready, fire, aim before being ready, aim, fire. Got it. Um, okay. Getting everybody on the same page before you begin. Now, if people were really um, at a high level of emotional intelligence – if the who moved my cheese phenomenon wasn't operating inside people, mm-hmm. when they had a conflict or a breakdown of some kind, they could just turn to each other and say, this isn't working, is it? And they go, nope. And they say, great, let's, let's put a new agreement in place. Wow. That's a very high level of emotional intelligence. But mm-hmm. in the ideal world, um, if people were operating at a really a high level of um, human consciousness and awareness, that would be the way that it would work. I get it. So, 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 so back from um, 
10.30. Now we're back in a place called Resolution at 12, where they're all aligned in terms of human energy. And the reason it's a cycle, um, Olivia, mm-hmm. because it keeps happening over and over again. No matter, how, no matter how good and clear and aligned we are today, um, spit will happen tomorrow. <laughs> so even within, say, the same project or the same day, I'm sorry, uh, yes, like the same team, maybe two days later, something comes up and they have to kind of go through it again. Is that kind of what it's, you're saying? Exactly. But after a while, people develop a facility. Uh, this kind of model is internalized, and they start to move through it a lot quicker. Oh, that's so, great. Well, yeah. so can you share some of the elements in the model? that In the model of agreement? Yeah. Well, the one, sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the way to get people aligned and on the same page at the beginning of any new project or collaboration is uh, what's our intention and vision? What do we want to create? Okay? You know, where we look out there three months or six months or a year, what's our intent and vision? What's the purpose of our interacting together? Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's one piece. Another piece is what, what roles does each person involved have? What do they take responsibility for? Mm -hmm. What, what promises does each individual make? What do they commit to actually do to bring that vision to reality? Right? What do they take responsibility for? One of the things, by the way, this is a very, very important one. Um, and why is it important? Because uh, what I find is in, in, in the ordinary uh, workplace, a lot of people don't have a, a, a huge consciousness around the promises we make. So, for example, um, I'll get you that report by Tuesday. Um, people sometimes don't recognize that they've made a promise that someone else is relying on. Mm -hmm. So either keep it or renegotiate it. Okay, very important. So I want to just push back. Well, I mean, I totally agree. And and I often think, or I want to know whether this fits in that uh, people that are chronically late for meetings, do you see that as also fitting into kind of this model? Absolutely. They're, They're breaking a promise. Okay. Yeah. They're 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 totally breaking a promise. Okay. You know, um, and 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 we see that all the time. Well, and uh, I would see it as some people you just knew it was going to happen, and you would always account for it. But to me, it just didn't seem fair because it was putting all this other people's time on hold. And and I think it, it's one of those things that is unconscious, and it may. I don't know that it's passive aggressive, but it could be, or self sabotaging. All those things are possible. But I think it's when I realized that I was doing it, probably not for those reasons, but I mean, for me, it might have been a bit of self sabotage. But I started to say, okay, I want to honor that other person. And if I have to get there early or be online early and then find something to do, at least I know I, I won't have something come up or I'll have time to factor any glitches in so that I can honor that agreement. So that's one of my pet peeves, I guess. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And, and promises are my, my, one of my pet peeves. But, you know, this notion of being made for meetings, um, I'm going to look at it from a slightly uh, different angle. Mm-hmm. And I would say it's rude. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's rude. I agree. Yeah. yeah it is. Just, Especially know, if it's it, chronic or, uh, right. it's, you know, exactly. unexcusable. I mean, Sure, it happens to all of us once in a while, but when it's right. chronic, it, yeah. it's it it it's just a question of root. Yeah. Right. Oh, so 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 some of the other critical elements of of having good effective agreements on the front end is making sure that people understand the value that they're getting from the project. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, we all understand what we're putting in, but we sometimes don't recognize what we're getting out. And it's real important for everybody to understand what they're getting out. Why? Because um, as soon as people perceive that they're not getting any value out of a, out of a, a collaboration, mm-hmm. they stop performing. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so What's in it, it for me? <laughs> exactly. Everybody's, everybody's, you know, everybody's listening to that with them um, radio station. Um, <laughs> metrics. How are you going to measure success? How do you know whether you've achieved the vision? And it's real important to get that into objective terms on the front end so that you don't have conflict and differences about whether or not we we did 
folks. Yeah. Um, concerns and fears on the front end. Um, geez, I know that George, last project he was in, he didn't perform on time, and it really killed the project. So let's talk about that a little bit before we move forward again on this um, new project. Um, I'm a little concerned because um, my senior manager um, is not fully on board in this situation um, to give me the time required. Mm -hmm. So talking about all those concerns and fears um, on the front end, right? right. Um, the idea of renegotiation, that when we begin, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know, mm -hmm. that stuff is going to come up um, that may require a little bit of renegotiation. And that's fine, okay? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, consequences or benefits. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, and if we don't achieve it, what are the consequences to the team, to the organization, to the individuals involved? Um, how will we move through conflict? Because we know that spit happens. And if you have a full conversation about all these pieces, at the end, the final thought is, do we have an agreement or not? And... That question really is about, do we trust everybody that's part of this collaboration? Wow. And that's the ultimate bottom line question. And, and the way you get to understand whether or not you trust is through this dialogue on the, on the front end or as the final piece of any conflict resolution. Right. Well, so do you have people that sort of self-select out of the process because they just can't handle the amount of vulnerability or uh, they have fear around it? Um, yeah, there are certain people that, that – and those are kind of the same people who have trouble with collaboration in general. And those are probably the folks – who don't have the degree of emotional intelligence that in many ways is required uh, for the workplace today. And, you know, I, I'd love to spend uh, a few minutes of the time we have left talking about um, emotional intelligence and also talking about some of the specific concerns about uh, using all of these things that I've talked about in the virtual workplace. I want to sort of go into why this is important in the digital era. Great. So um, just before I jump in, um, the website, my website is not resolutionarythinking.com, but I'm glad you're thinking about resolutionary thinking, <laughs> Olivia. It's, it's resolutionworks.com. Resolutionworks.com. That's okay. That's How did I get that? Sorry about that, and thanks for that correction. That's, that's okay. Um, so, um, two things. Number one, just to, to, to quickly um, give folks the overview of what emotional intelligence is, because it's, it, it's such a critical piece. Number one, it's, it's self-awareness and self-knowledge, knowing who you are, also knowing uh, what's going on inside of you at any moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, second piece of emotional intelligence is self-regulation or self-control, the ability to, to regulate, uh, monitor, and, and control your own behavior. Um, self-motivation, the capacity to um, choose the goals and, and figure out what's important for you. Um, empathy. Critical piece, caring, concern for others. And uh, the fifth element is good um, interpersonal skills, good communication skills, the ability to form teams, to create relationships, to move through conflict. Those are all kind of the critical, critical pieces of emotional intelligence. Now, what really is um, important and unique about the digital world, about not seeing each other face-to-face, -face, is, you know, when we're in a face-to-face -face environment, um, we see people and have water cooler conversations. We get um, the broad bandwidth of that person's um, physical energy. We get to see their facial expressions. We get the visuals of working with them. 
And when when we're distributed, when we don't see each other face to face, there's a tendency that people have to just you know jump right into business. Um, there's also a tendency that people multi task while they're you know working on a a, 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 a webex or even a skype call uh, a group call and so we've got to make things um, especially engaging and we have to spend some time doing that socializing but um, doing it in a virtual world. so uh, there's a wonderful phrase that I first heard about seven or eight years ago um, that was uh, used by a senior manager of a large organization who was responsible for managing a worldwide team. She said what she started to do was have virtual hours, okay, yeah. <laughs> to create connectivity. Of course, some people would be having, you know, morning coffee. Some people would be having lunch. Some people would be having, you know, an end of the day cocktail. Um, and for some people, it was, uh, you know, uh, an after dinner coffee. But people were connecting in that way, and and there was a specific intention to create the connection. Now, so that's that's one piece. Other piece is the importance of um, having the clarity of agreement of people's participation, the importance of having everybody be aware of, you know, what does veil mean um, when someone is um, kind of um, working virtually, um, the importance of having clear agreements. Now, um, having said all, all of these things, there's also one other aspect that I, that I think is real important. So. A lot of vendors in, in the virtual marketplace are selling collaboration tools, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, yeah. the, one of the biggest one, obviously, being my of SharePoint, okay? Now, I have a, a different view of what they're selling. Um, I say that it's not really selling collaboration tools. They're selling connectivity, right. okay? Yeah. That all the things I've been talking about today are critical for effective collaboration. And that if we don't um, understand and use and have that human capacity to collaborate, all those tools are not going to really be helpful. Yeah. Now, I, I know that you were around um, when technology was first being implemented, just like I was. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> um, I know sometimes we hate to think about that, but it's true. I, yeah. I remember, you know, being in the workplace in the early 1980s when um, when uh, uh, workstations were first starting to pop up, mm -hmm. and um, you know, carrying a laptop since around 1987. Wow! Um, wow! I remember so, taking a course in 1993 on the internet, and there were only 300 websites and they were mostly <laughs> mostly recipes <laughs> so recipes and things okay. so, yeah there, there you go it was about information share okay mm -hmm. yeah um i remember the mantra as technology first started to appear that if you have a lousy paper system that technology is not going to help it's just going to magnify it Wow. Okay, so so in the same vein, what I believe is that if your human skills aren't good, um, technology isn't really going to help. Yeah. So another way of looking at that is is I say, um, if I were if I were making up the world and I were operating all all the um, quote collaboration um, tools that are out there, I would say it's real important for people to go through a tutorial about the human elements of collaboration uh, before they start to use the, the wonderful connectivity tools that are out there. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad you think so. Mm -hmm. And I also have seen, well, my sense is that it's people's personal maybe the way they were brought up or their own wounding that gets in the way. So one of the things that I kind of like about 
this, I'll call it pressure to be more aware of our humanness and our human emotional skills is it's in many ways helping people get healthier, emotionally healthier. And I've seen people go, I saw, I remember a friend or a fellow being sent to a leadership training because the board sent him because he was so, had such a hard edge to him. And by the end of the week, uh, he had opened up, had grieved some early losses in his life, and it actually ended up saving his marriage. So I could see all of this training as being not just better for achievement in business, but perhaps achievement in life. Oh, absolutely. These are, there's no question about it, Olivia. These are, these are, are life skills, they're human skills, and, and they're essential um, to have in today's workplace. And, and I so agree with you. I, I just finished doing a, um, a three-day program um, for a major uh, healthcare organization. And I started off by saying the good news, folks, is uh, you guys all get to learn stuff you know, at the expense of your um, employer, and one of your fringe benefits is you get to take this home <laughs> and use it and use it in your life on a day-to-day basis. But yeah, and I also agree with what you said. You know, the 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 story of the executive who was sent out by the board. I had a, I had a consulting partner who used to use a, a great phrase. She said, Some "People are just not housebroken." <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, so. Um, <laughs> I'd love to hear uh, you uh, in this newsletter, Beyond Ideology, which I highly recommend. And you can, if anybody listening wants to get it, go to resolutionworks.com and sign up. Um, you mentioned the Mobile Business Academy and uh, Skillsoft. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Yeah. Um, I've been working on this for a while. The Skillsoft one is something that um, will be out in the springtime. Um, Skillsoft.com. They do a lot of, um, you know, quick hitting um, video kinds of education. Um, they're about um, uh, three minutes each. I, I created a series of eleven, um, and they pretty much cover um, everything that I've I've covered today, but obviously in in, in greater detail. Oh, um, great. Yeah. So that's Skillsoft.com, and the Business Academy is something that I'm real excited about. Um, I'm, I'm working with a, um, a friend, colleague, former um, chief learning officer for a number of major corporations, and he put together a number of um, experts, and we created kind of a, a, a curriculum, and the first five pieces of the curriculum will be rolled out uh, in the spring, and it's it's mobile m o b i l e biz b i z academy dot com. People can kind of kind of download a sample, um, but the these will consist of um, uh, ten um, six to ten minute audio segments and uh, workbooks that are about sixty five or seventy pages. So it's they're, they're self-paced learning, and um, it's it's kind of a pretty uh, I'm pretty excited. I'm I'm excited about the um, other work that'll be part of this uh, curriculum. That's that's great. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. So we just have about a minute left. I just if you could give us maybe thirty seconds on how you see these skills being useful in government and internationally. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, business has become a major culture institution in the world, even more than important than government. And if people can start developing themselves as individuals through using all these skills, I think we, we could reduce a lot of the huge cost of conflict in the world, the emotional cost, the physical cost, the societal cost, the health cost, um, and the productivity costs. Um, and I think we could go a long way towards creating um, a much more effective um, culture. Thank you. Great. Well, so it looks like we're about out of time. Stuart, thank you so much for being my guest today. I hope you'll come back and visit us again. I will. It was, it was a pleasure, uh, Olivia. Thank you. My pleasure as well. So next week, my guest will be John Stossel. He's 
known as the guru of customer service by USA Today and Entrepreneur Magazines. He's a best-selling author and internationally recognized service strategist and president of the Service Quality Institute. And during the interview, we'll be discussing his new book, Moving Up, A Step-by-Step Guide to Creating Your Success, where he teaches us how to get people to remove their self-imposed limitations, observe themselves as better, as we talked about today, being more self-aware, set goals, and use visualization and affirmations for greater success. So you won't want to miss this show. Thank you for tuning into Quantum Business Insights. I'm your host, Olivia Parrud, and we'll see you next week. <music> 